Of all the Surrealists, Kurt Seligman seems to have had the most foresight, as he moved to the USA immediately after the outbreak of the war in 1939, and remained there till he died in 1962. He had sufficient funds to buy an old dairy farm in the small town of Sugarloaf in upstate New York, and turn a barn into a studio. The last painting he created in 1939, whilst in Europe, was Sabbath Phantoms. The figure on the left stands watching a wild group who seem to be urging him to join them and rush away. This could be read as a presage of the need to escape the coming conflict. In 1943, he painted The Spirit of Conviction, perhaps reflecting the initial successes of the Allies at that time against the Nazis. Here we see a kind of angel or spirit holding a flaming torch and inspiring those below to move forward. By no means can all his paintings of that period be read as reflecting the conflict in Europe. Seligman retained his deep interest in the occult. We see this in his 1946 painting, Initiation, with a blindfold female figure being led into a magical group. At that time, Seligman actually arranged parties at which he and others reenacted magical rituals. Dali did not have to escape from Europe at the outset of the Second World War. He was already in New York, working on a number of projects. In March 1939, there was the notorious incident of the Bonwit Teller window display. This high fashion department store had commissioned Dali to make two window designs for the Fifth Avenue store. He created two windows on the theme of Narcissus, one being day and the other night. The day window featured a fur-lined bathtub filled with water on which Narcissi flowers were floating, in which an 1890s unclothed wax mannequin was stepping. The windows attracted so much controversy and massive crowds that the store management felt they had to replace the mannequins with conventionally dressed ones. Dali was furious and got into the window display, and in the ensuing struggle, he managed to push the bath and himself through the plate glass window so that he fell out into the street. He was arrested but released. This unplanned incident was likely to have given Dali the idea for actively creating such stunts in later years. It provided enormous free publicity for his exhibition that opened a few weeks later at the Julian Levy Gallery. Through this exhibition, Dali sold 21 paintings, which made him one of the richest younger artists of that time. A few months later, Dali's Dream of Venus Pavilion at the New York World Fair in Flushing Meadow opened. This was a riot of Dali imagery taken from earlier paintings, as well as new material. As with the shop window display, Dali pressed on with his own original ideas, but then met opposition from the committee. They were especially against him depicting Botticelli's image of Venus with a fish's head over the entrance to the structure. He found it absurd that the committee considered that a mermaid which shows a woman with a fish's tail was okay, but not the other way round. The visitors to this pavilion passed through four dreams, two installations combining painting, mannequins and objects, and two scenes taking place in glass swimming tanks, one wet, one dry. These had the walls painted with various tableaux, and were peopled with scantily dressed young women who undertook various activities, sleeping, swimming, sunbathing, oblivious of the audience. In the wet room, 
A mannequin was dressed up with a keyboard, and the others would play her body as if it were a piano. In 1939, Dali had painted The Enigma of Hitler, which makes allusion to the death of peace in Europe. A huge telephone receiver drops tears, and on the branches of a dead tree there hang umbrellas and bats. A scrap of paper with Hitler's photograph lies below on a plate. As Dali explains, Chamberlain's umbrella appeared in his painting in a sinister light, made evident by the bat, and it struck me when I painted it as a thing of enormous anguish. Later, once the war was well underway, he painted the face of war with its powerful image of skulls within the eyes of skulls within the eyes of a skull. In 1943, he created one of his most engaging paintings, the allegorical geopolitical child. Here Dali presents the shift in geopolitics from Europe to America using the powerful image of a child emerging from the world egg. In 1944, he returned from this kind of allegorical expression to his pure paranoid critical surrealism in his dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate. When the Nazis took over Paris and the northern part of France in 1940, most of the Surrealists moved to the southern part of the country, which was then under the control of Marshal Pétain. Many intellectuals and artists made their way to Marseille, where the American journalist Varian Fry had set up an emergency rescue committee. Here we see Fry on the right with Breton, Breton's wife, and Max Ernst. Fry set up various escape routes and was able to obtain travel papers and forge permissions and visas. He set up a base in a chateau outside the French port of Marseille, named the Villa Air Belle, which had 18 bedrooms and large common rooms. Breton and some of the Surrealists, including Victor Brauner, Jacques Herro, Jacqueline Lambda, André Masson, Oscar Dominguez, Max Ernst, Marc Chagall, Marcel Duchamp, Benjamin Perret, Remedius Varro, and Tristan Zara arrived in late 1940 and stayed for some months until Fry was able to move them on to safety. Most of them eventually found their way to the USA. Here are Breton, Perret, and Remedius Varro at the Villa Airbell. Life at the Villa was not all gloom and despair. The Surrealists created their famous set of playing cards that we looked at in a previous lesson. They also organised auctions and outdoor exhibitions of their work, sometimes hanging paintings from one of the plane trees. Here we see three now well-known paintings, Max Ernst's The Robing of the Bride and Leonor Carrington's Self-Portrait and her smaller portrait of Ernst. Ernst himself is seated in the tree. Once across the Atlantic, most of the Surrealists located themselves in New York. Ernst married Peggy Guggenheim probably to make it easier for him to remain in the USA, and they initially lived in New York. In 1946, when Ernst married Dorothea Tanning, they sought a more remote setting and moved to Arizona. Later in 1956, once things in Europe had stabilised, Ernst felt able to go back to Paris. Palin, Varro and Carrington gained asylum in Mexico. We will look at the exiles in Mexico in a later lesson. It is worth looking at Max Ernst's output when he had moved to the USA. One of his key works is Europe After the Rain, 
which she began painting in 1940, whilst still in France. Somehow he managed to bring this across the Atlantic and finish the piece while in New York. It extensively uses decalomania, that is, blotting paint with a sheet of glass and then pulling it off the canvas to leave behind complex textures. Apparently, he picked up this technique from Oscar Dominguez in 1938. Ernst would find some of these shapes suggesting an image, and he would then take to using the brush to give them form. It is commonly thought that this painting is entirely about the war in Europe, suggesting a ravaged, war-torn landscape but there may be a more personal component. To the right of centre, we see two figures back to back, walking away from each other. One is a bird-headed male figure. Ernst often liked to refer to himself through this bird image, often calling it Loplop. Walking away is a female figure with long dark hair. This could refer to Leonora Carrington, from whom he had become separated in France in 1939, after he was arrested. Carrington had a breakdown and fled to Portugal, married a diplomat at the Mexican embassy, in order to ensure her a safe passage to the USA. Though they often saw each other in New York, their relationship was over as far as Carrington was concerned, something Ernst found difficult to accept. Another key painting of this period, again using the Calamania, was the Antipope. The Antipope appears on the left in a red robe with a horse's head. Ernst, who was well studied in early European art, may have seen an antipapal image from the early 16th century Reformation such as this woodcut. In his antipope, there is a gathering of three figures on the right. One is a horse-headed figure in armour being embraced by two young women. The horse-headed knight would appear to be Ernst himself and the bluish-green woman a representation of Leonora Carrington. Between them is a blonde-haired young woman who may be Peggy Guggenheim's daughter Pegine. If we read the painting within this context, then the anti-pope is Peggy Guggenheim herself. Being an anti-pope was certainly not pejorative to the Surrealists. Peggy, who through her galleries was a key promoter of Surrealist art, would no doubt have been delighted to have been thought of as an anti-pope, an anti-establishment figure. This painting would appear also to draw from the structure of his 1940 robing of the bride, which clearly depicts Carrington. And it may also have resonances with a much earlier work, Long Live Love, or The Charming Country, in which we see a blue-coloured male figure being embraced in a standing position by a blonde-haired woman. Some commentators suggest this is Gala Eluard, whom Ernst was having an affair with, at the time. Many of Ernst's paintings during the war exile in New York used the Calamania. We see this in Convolvulus, Day and Night, Napoleon in the Wilderness, Totem and Taboo, The Eye of Silence and so on. But one stands out as being in a different style. This is called Surrealism and Painting and was created in 1942. On the left we see a bird-headed mother figure who appears to be comforting and protecting her child who sits on a pedestal or box within which we see various tools including a palette knife. A hand reaches out from this figure and creates an abstract painting of lines and splashes of colour. This painting could well be Ernst giving form to his perception that figurative or verist surrealism was undergoing a change through biomorphism towards abstract expressionism. We will look at this transformation in a later lesson. It is perhaps relevant 
that Max Ernst's son Jimmy was one of the major movers in the development of abstract expressionism. Here is one of his paintings, Biological Discovery, from 1944. Jimmy Ernst had been nourished and brought up with figurative surrealism, but then struck out in a new direction when he began painting in the USA. Max Ernst himself gradually turned more to abstraction in the late 50s and 60s, as we see in 33 Little Girls Chasing Butterflies of 1958 and The Cardinals Are Dying of 1962. Yves Tongue had met the American artist K. Sage in 1938 in Paris. With the outbreak of the Second World War, she returned to the USA, and from there arranged for Tongue to have a solo show at the New York Gallery of Pierre Matisse. Sage and Tongue married in 1940, and he remained in the USA until his death in 1955. In his paintings during the war years, and indeed for the years following, he just continued his previous style, gradually refining and adding some elements, building towards more complexity rather than having a new subject matter. We see this clearly in his 1941 Earth and Air and Indefinite Divisibility of 1942. We can see this evolving complexity in their motion has not ceased yet of 1945. Oscar Dominguez was another surrealist rescued by Varian Fry. Here are some of the surrealists at the Villa Air Bell. Dominguez is on the left. In the early 1930s, Dominguez was one of the foremost exponents of figurative surrealism. In 1936, he began to experiment with Decalomania. In 1937, he created Decalomania with River and Bridge. When he was relocated to the USA, he seems to have abandoned Decalomania in favour of a style borrowed from Picasso. Thus, his 1942 painting, Woman on a Divan, and also from that year, his rather Cubist-inspired Women, and the Cubist deconstruction of the globe, El Mapa Mundi, in 1943. He became increasingly drawn to Picasso's bull images with his Toromachia, or bullfighting painting, of 1943, and he continued working with this image well into the 1950s. Although not an exile as such, it will be timely to look at the work of Kay Sage. She came from a wealthy American family, and in 1937 she moved to Paris, intending to establish herself as an artist. She became inspired by Surrealism and got to know Yves Tanguay. André Breton was unhappy that she was from a wealthy background, and his negative attitude towards her led to a break with Tanguay, with whom he had been very close since the mid-1920s. Here is a 1947 photo of them at their home in Connecticut with Marcel Duchamp. Sage was very attracted by the work of de Chirico, and this influences her early work from the 1930s, as with Monolith of 1937 and My Room Has Two Doors of 1939. Her paintings only rarely show human figures, and these are usually wrapped or enveloped in cloth. Thus we see the 14 daggers of 1942, 
with two rapt figures set in a dehierical metaphysical space. And Shivering Mountain of 1943 has another similar rapt figure. As with her husband Tongi, she was drawn to depicting remote landscapes with a far horizon devoid of human figures. However, she did use a rather different pictorial language from Tongi. While he filled his landscapes with polished, rounded, pebble-like organic forms, K. Sage showed strange architectural constructions, some of soft flowing cloth and others of harder materials. A good example of this is her 1944 painting, In the Third Sleep. As with Tongi, her titles are enigmatic and do not seem to give much insight into the structure of the painting. In the 1950s, her work often depicts architectural elements such as with no passing, and perhaps her best known painting of hers, Tomorrow is Never. In 1956, she relented somewhat from not depicting human figures in her remote landscapes. In another painting for which she is usually known, Le Passage. Her husband had died in 1955, and some commentators have read into this painting an autobiographical element, viewing it as herself gazing into emptiness. The title can be translated as The Passing, referring to the death of her husband, and perhaps that's why it is in French. Whether or not this is a valid reading of Le Passage, Kate Sage was so deeply affected by his death that she almost completely abandoned painting. This work sold in 2014 for five and a half million dollars. Another late piece is a 1958 painting, The Answer is No. Here she depicts a mass of frames and blank rectangular shapes which is easy to read as a crowded mass of blank canvases and stretchers, paintings that would never be. In her diary entry for August 1961, she wrote, I have said all that I have to say. There is nothing left for me to do but scream. Sadly, she took her own life in 1963. We will now also consider another artist who, though not an exile herself, had married one of the key surrealist exiles. Dorothea Tannen came to New York in 1935 and worked as a commercial artist. In 1936, she had gone to the Museum of Modern Art's seminal exhibition, Fantastic Art, Dada and Surrealism, and there seen works of Browner, Dominguez, Ernst, Tange, Dali, and many of the more minor figures. This inspired her to adopt a surrealist style. In 1942, she painted Birthday. That year, gallery owner Julian Levy introduced her to Max Ernst, who came to her studio and was profoundly impressed by this painting. After his initial visit, Dorothea and Ernst played chess every day for a week. Then he moved in, and after Ernst had divorced Peggy Guggenheim, they married and relocated to Arizona before finally moving to France. In 1943, she produced one of her now best-known paintings, Eine kleine Nachtmusik, in which a child encounters an enormous dead sunflower in what appears to be a hotel corridor. Beside her, leaning against the door jamb, is another child or perhaps a life-size female doll. Tanning wrote about this painting some years later. It's about confrontation. Everyone believes he, she is in his hard drama. While they don't always have giant sunflowers, the most aggressive of flowers, to contend with, there are always stairways, 
hallways, even very private theatres where the suffocations and the finalities are being played out. She had explored similar imagery a year earlier in her children's games. Again, these figures are depicted in a long corridor with a distant source of light. As we have seen, Ernst and Tanny enjoyed playing chess. Here, being conscious of the presence of the photographer, he holds up a wooden picture frame in order to frame the photograph. So, it was wholly appropriate that in 1944 she created the painting Endgame, in which a female shoe stamps upon a bishop's mitre with such force that it distorts and almost pushes through the chessboard. Her paintings throughout the 1940s are powerful and self-assured. Her 1944 self-portrait, in which she shows herself standing clothed only in a nightdress before the majestic, powerful landscape of Arizona's mesas. She does not appear to be overwhelmed by this, but instead stands confidently gazing and taking in the scene. She wrote about this some time later. In that camera-sharp place where planetary upheaval had left its signature, the now placid monuments that, as far as anyone out there cared, had been there forever. I would undertake, dare would be a truer word, to paint the unpaintable. She continued to pour out major pieces, often shifting styles, with such as the 1945 Truth About Comets. The young student, with his seeming obsession with female breasts. Avatar of 1947 depicts a young woman with long hair flying on a trapeze in the upper part of her bedroom, which is shown in a false perspective. And of course, Max in a Blue Boat of the same year, with a signature Loplop bird figure on the white sail. The enigmatic On Time Off Time is again in a different style. It seems that Tanning is able to transcend mere style and so creates each work as a thing in itself. In Interior with Sudden Joy, of 1951, she shows two rather dissolute young women in front of a blackboard which Tanning later reveals as having some phrases from verses of Arthur Rambo. One girl is petting a large dog, probably based on Tanning and Ernst's dog Kachina, while the other girl, having dropped a cigarette, gazes at a strange tableau where a black man is embracing a tree-like form wrapped in white cloth. From a door at the back, a woman is about to intrude on these events. A painting from 1954, Family Portrait, presents a nuclear family in which each person is displayed at a different scale. The mother is only marginally larger than the dog, while the daughter sitting at the table is twice her size and the father dominates over the whole scene so much that we only see him from his chest to forehead. A year or so after this was painted, Dorothea Tanning began to shift to a more abstract and less figurative style. We see this in her The Ill Forgotten of 1955 and The Tempest in Yellow of the following year and Moon in the Other of 1960. She revisited her figurative style in the late 1970s in The Web of Dreams and Notes for an Apocalypse of 1978. She lived to the immense age of 101 and must surely be seen as one of the most significant American painters of the 20th century. She also took the opportunity later in her life to write extensively about her work and she provided, as we have seen, a commentary 
on some of her major paintings. For the next part of the series of lessons, we'll look at the Surrealist exiles in Mexico. <laughs>